So here we are at the actual 10th book on the list. I was wrong when I said that in the last video and also the last book that I have that is not a part of the shortlist that I have yet to do a review on. So from here on out, we'll only be talking about shortlisted books, which is crazy, but I'm excited to talk about this book. I do still have Poison Ivy. I still apologize for it, but it is better than it was in the last video. And yes, hi. My name is Sarah Freshly. Welcome back to Freshly. <laughs> okay, so I think that this is going to be another one of those quicker videos for me, uh, or like less structured, I guess. Um, they tend to be quicker when they're less structured, but I guess that's not technically always the case. Uh, but it's not because of anything bad about this book. It was just... I didn't have like that same feeling that I have while reading a lot of the books on the book or long list or literary fiction in general where I'm just like pinpointing um, themes and stuff that I want to talk about but instead I kind of have just like a stream of consciousness. So China Room. This was actually the only book that I owned before the long list was announced because I would have read this either way. It was also one of the two books that Kieran and I were able to guess would be on the long list. It was this and Claire and the Sun were the only two <laughs> predictions that we got right. So China Room is um, kind of split perspective, but also split timelines, I guess. Uh, so we've got a story that takes place in 1929, I think. Ooh, really nailed that. So yeah, part of the story is Mehar in 1929, who is essentially trying to figure out who she's married to, which sounds weird, but this is because she was in a marriage with, or in a wedding with uh, three brothers and she was one of three brides and she can't figure out because of what she was wearing during the day, because of how similar they look, uh, which of the brothers that she married. So her story largely in the beginning is her just trying to, and the other two women, I shouldn't even say women, they're like teenagers, um, but they're each trying to figure out who they're married to, using like little observations here and there, uh, talk of calloused hands and um, what one likes to eat and things like that. And she's also living out in a rural kind of countryside area, so she doesn't have a lot of access to really anything except for this family that she is now in. And then in 1999, we have a young man that was related to Meher, but he is was born in England and then he comes to India and ends up staying in the China room, which was the same room that Meher and the other girls were staying in when they were living in that house. So it is kind of this fascinating juxtaposition where you have a woman or really a teenager, I think she's 15. Um, actually, I'm pretty sure it says it in the opening line. This book has got such a good opening line. Meher is not so obedient a 15 year old that she won't try to uncover which of the three brothers is her husband. But yeah, so you've got this 15 year old girl in uh, India in the 1920s who has like no power over herself, who is trapped in this new family. And while she is trying to make the best of the situation, I guess by becoming better friends with the other girls, and trying to figure out who her husband is. She is still like trapped there. There's not really much else she can do. And then you've got this young man who's unnamed by the way in the 90s who largely has freedom but in fact he's kind of trapped as well because he's dealing with addiction and so you see his story kind of play out where he's going through like major withdrawals he ends up staying in the china room or at least in the same house um, and fixing up the house so it's kind of funny to see like both of these parties kind of trapped but one is trapped by circumstance while the other one is trapped by addiction, but he does still have obviously a lot more liberties than Meher does in her time period and being a woman. Now, one great part about this book is uh, really how observational it is, where a lot of the book lives in kind of just watching what other people are doing, uh, listening to what other people are doing, which is good because it puts you in the mindset of Meher and what she is 
supposed to do, expected to do. She's not really supposed to like talk and communicate, but instead she's there to serve. And she is just needing to use her senses as much as possible to figure out, you know, who her husband is or more about the family background. There are things that she just doesn't know because it's thought of as something that she doesn't need to know. And in the evenings, uh, typically one of the new brides gets called into not sleep in the china room, but are instead told to go to this other room, which is very dark. And the whole purpose of it is to procreate, is to uh, get pregnant with a child, particularly a son. And this is really the only times that they get like one-on-one -on -one time with their husband, but because it's so dark, they can't really tell uh, who it is, which of the three brothers it is. So in this room, they're being, they're using even more of their observational skills to try to figure out who this is because they don't even have the benefit of sight on their side. Bob the Booker does a fantastic job of talking about this point in his video. So I don't wanna talk too much about it because he just did such a great job and I highly recommend going to watch his video. I really, really liked his review on this book. Now, after I read this book, I watched a few interviews with Sahoda and I found that this was the book that I most enjoyed watching interviews about it after the fact. And I think it's because I don't have a ton to say about this book. Uh, and I don't know exactly why that is. I think it's just told really well and the writing is great. And Zahoda doesn't really pad out the book at all. It's, it's a short book for being, you know, two people's stories and he does such a good job of keeping it tight, I guess, and making every word count, which is something that he talks about in his interviews being very intentional, and that's how he likes to write. But watching these interviews is really fascinating because the idea for this book originally came from uh, Sahota's grandmother, where there's this family lore that Sahota's grandmother, uh, she was married in a wedding ceremony, including uh, four couples. So four brothers and then four women, including his grandmother. And it's often said that she didn't know who she was, which brother she was married to until he was holding their child for the first time. And then she knew which one was her husband. And while he doesn't really know if that's just become an exaggeration, like an exaggerated version of this family story, he talks about how it's always referred to is kind of a joke and how funny it is that, uh, you know, ancestors are just kind of going along with whatever's happening. But of course, he wanted to dive deeper into that because his grandmother like was a person and with real feelings and probably felt very vulnerable in that time period, not knowing who your husband was. And even if that was an exaggerated story, then he still wanted to dive into what it would feel like to be somebody in that position. Now, the unnamed man is slightly based off of Sohoto himself. He has like a few uh, connecting points with him. He was also born in England. Um, he also didn't read a novel until I think he was 18 years old. Uh, so that I think is funny. And also his first novel was Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie, which I actually have a copy of right here. So yeah, spoiler alert, I will at some point be making a video for Midnight's Children. Oh, and I'd like to clarify that Midnight's Children was Sahota's first novel. I don't know if he says that the unnamed man, like what his first novel was and if it was Midnight's Children. Um, but that was just the real life version of that story. So overall, I did really enjoy this book. Uh, like I said, it's written so well and the back and forth nature of it is also great. The author just does such a great job with this book and telling these two stories. And while I didn't find that there was anything that was like over the top made me love this book. I mean, if you watch my videos, you probably know I like to have themes that I can latch onto that run throughout the book. And while of course this book has themes, I think every book really does. Um, I didn't have that reaction with any specific thing that was running throughout the book, but instead just fully enjoyed the reading process all the way through. And I felt like it was told just really, really well. And for that reason, 
I do recommend this book. I think that it, it's just, it's a good read. And I think that the writing itself is, is enough to make me want to recommend it not to mention that it is just a really good story. There is this feeling of not knowing what's going to happen and you have kind of a rough idea, but you're not really sure because obviously you know that the this unnamed man is going to exist later and that Meher was, you know, in his family. But besides that, there is this element of wanting to find out what happens. There is another book I would like to recommend if you've read China Room and really liked it. Uh, a Woman is No Man is a fantastic book. I can't remember the author's name, but I'll put it up here. While it is within an entirely different culture than China Room, it does explore similar ideas through the book, specifically around women, which you could probably guess from the title. Uh, so if you like China Room, I think that you'll also really like uh, that book if you haven't read it yet. But that's actually going to do it for this video. So please let me know if you read this book, what you thought of it. And uh, if you like this video, I hope that you'll consider subscribing and I will see you in the next one. Bye.